This is chapter 10, part two lecture video. We were on slide 15. Physician-patient developed in 1828 based on the need for the doctor to have true and accurate information to treat a patient. Limited privilege, only some information is blocked. Basic identification from the patient is admissible. It covers what is necessary for treatment, not casual conversations or overheard comments. That's not covered. Slide 16, physicians may be required to report some information. Child abuse, gunshot wounds, uh, results of a court order exam, or if they're testifying as an expert. It can be extended by the state statute to others in medical professions, psycho psychotherapists, psychologists, for example. Page 293 describes at the bottom the patient physician privilege. Page 294 gives exceptions. Let's look at that really fast. At the bottom of page 293, the physician is the person reasonably believed by the patient to be a licensed pra practice in medicine. The patient is the person who consulted the physician for a purpose of a diagnosis or treatment. What is covered? Information obtained by the physician for the purpose of diagnosis or treatment. And who holds the privilege? The patient holds the privilege. Exceptions on page 294. Advice sought on how to conceal a crime. Advice sought to help plan the crime. Information the physician is required by law to report to authorities. That's not covered. Notes. Some states do not allow the physician patient privilege to be used in criminal cases. If the state law mandates that the doctor reported a particular incident, the privilege does not apply in those cases. Incidents that must be reported vary from state to state, such as child abuse, gunshot wounds. Um, slide 17, clergy penitent privilege. This privilege did not exist at common law, so each state created their own, and it's confidential communication between a clergy, a priest, um, the privilege belongs to each, the priest and the um, church member. Recently, some states have created exceptions for child abuse. Page 296, 297 discusses that more. Slide 18, media reporter privilege. The First Amendment does not create a special media privilege. Let's look at page 299. Um, only state statutes or case law will create the privilege. 31 states have some form, 25 in total have some case law protection, and it's a wide variation. Page 299, privilege for news reporter described. The news reporter is a person employed by the media to investigate stories and report on them. The media includes print media as well as radio and television. What is covered? The reporter's notes and identity of informants. Who holds the privilege? The reporter. Exceptions frequently found in criminal cases. Some states make an exception for prosecution of serious crimes if it can be shown that there is no other source for the information requested. What is covered? Examples. Notes, film clips, recordings, and so on. Let's look at slide 19. Zerker versus Stanford Daily. The police wanted access to photos taken by a student paper at Stanford University. The police obtained warrants. The paper sued under the First and Fourth Amendment. The Supreme Court upheld the warrant. Later, the U.S. Congress passed specific legislation to protect papers from such searches. Slide 21, media reporter privilege continued. Reporters feel ethical obligation to keep some sources confidential. The courts recognize this only as a limited privilege. Courts will compel a reporter to divulge sources on pain of contempt of court. So they'll go to uh, pay, contempt of court. And page 300 of your textbook talks about that a little bit more, that some states require a reporter to give the names of sources if there's no other way to get information for that case. Slide 22, executive privilege. This is the President of the United States. Claims that the President does not need to disclose confidential communications. The first claim by George Washington it's considered a limited privilege. It re requirements to pierce it, the confidential communication needed for a criminal or civil matter, the statement is requested under subpoena, in-camera proceeding to weigh, weigh meritus. Page 301, all the way at the bottom, last paragraph. First, it is presumed that the president has the right to refuse access to the confidential decision-making process. Second, statements that meet the test of admissibility and, re and relevance must be isolated. Third, the district court judge will hold an in-camera hearing where the material that the executive branch claims is privileged will be examined. Only the federal judge and an attorney representing the president will be present at the hearing. The outcome of the hearing will be an order detailing what, if anything, will be admissible at the criminal trial in question.
And page 302, every president since John F. Kennedy has invoked executive privilege. Ha, slide 23, Nixon. That's a good example. The National Committee headquarters at Watergate Office Complex in D.C., um, the offices were bugged. This is just some background information. Okay, let me, let me back up. Some background information before we dive into slide 23. The Watergate scandal occurred in the early 1970s. In June, June 17, 1972, there was a break-in at the Democratic National Committee headquarters at the Watergate Office Complex in D.C., the offices were bugged because they were there were political opponents of President Nixon. Nixon also ordered the harassment of activist groups and political figures using the FBI, CIA, IRS abuses of power. Forty-three people were incarcerated, and many were Nixon's top administrative officials. So that's kind of the background of what happened with Watergate. Slide 23. During Watergate, Nixon sought to claim executive privilege was absolute, so he didn't want any of that brought out. The Supreme Court recognized the privilege as necessary, but put limits on its application. The privilege must yield to the demonstrated specific need of evidence in a in pending, uh, pending criminal trial. So that's a good example. Slide 24. Privilege for official inf information. The public has a limited right to access information held by the government often available under statute, most commonly requested under the Freedom of Information Act, and it's frequent, very infrequently an issue in active criminal cases. Page 303 at the top talks about this. Table 10-3, the type of information. The Freedom of Information Act is federal. The application, it allows access to information retained by federal government. There are exceptions. The identity of an informant, the application, police have privilege not to disclose identity of informants, but the judge can order disclosure if it is crucial to the defense. Type of information, ongoing investigations. Application, police have the right to refuse to disclose information about an ongoing investigation. Privilege ceases once investigation is finished. Personnel records, application, personnel records of government employees are privileged. A judge can order disclosure of relevant information, however. Slide... 25, identity of police informants. Limited privilege to keep informants confidential applies only if the police have made representations of confidentiality of the, to the informant, and the informant's identity may be disclosed if necessary for the defense, but not just when there's probable cause. To, um, page 303 at the bottom talks more about the privilege not to disclose identity of informants. Slide 26, McCurry versus Illinois talks about that is an example of a probable cause hearing to get the identity of an informant. In slide 27, identity of police informants, the decision to peers is deciding in an in-camera proceeding. The police may refuse, but generally must then dismiss charges and also covers records held by the police. Page 305 talks about privilege to withhold personnel files for government employees. And that is the end of chapter 10.